um, this lecture is about the principles and elements of traditional Chinese architecture as part of the uh, module for the overseas Chinese architecture and settlement. This video was prepared for the student who never studied um, traditional Chinese architecture before to let them have some idea of what is uh, traditional uh, Chinese architecture. This poster you see on the screen uh, is, was one of the posters we designed it, uh, for an exhibition we organized in Singapore a few years ago. The exhibition is entitled Hokkien, uh, Hokkien Architecture from Ken Hokkien to Ling Lok House. This exhibition uh, is organized by the Department of Architecture, National University of Singapore, which has support from the Singapore Hokkien Hui Guan and URA. Uh, over the poster, you can see this is the Ken Hokkien Temple one of the famous uh, Chinese heritage in Singapore. At the foreground, you see the, um, the timber structure, or grand timber structure of a tra uh, traditional Chinese houses. And this, is, this house was the, is the um, ancestral hall of uh, Ling Lok House in Nan'an, Fujian. Ling Lok uh, was uh, one of the famous uh, Chinese builder and contractor in Singapore follow to the what hero Ling Lu Xing. We use this poster to show the connection, the link between the uh, Chinese architecture in Singapore and those built in uh, southern Fujian. So uh, for the study of the Chinese architecture in Singapore, um, we have to look at the uh, Chinese architecture in China itself. Uh, to understand what's the character of the Chinese architecture and what kind of characters actually we retained it in the Chinese architecture in Singapore uh, to understand the origin and will help us to understand the transformation uh, we had in Singapore. Let us to identify the, uh, what the influence we received from other countries and other ethnic groups. This is another uh, drone photos uh, we took during our uh, field trip to Southern Fujian. Uh, it shows another overseas Chinese house in Quanzhou, Dang De Hong, for the overseas Chinese family called Dang De Hong. This family also somehow link, uh, linked to the uh, Ling Lo family. So this kind of red brick architecture make the, uh, the Southern Fujian architecture quite different from those um, in other parts of China. If you visit uh, Jiangnan area in the south of the Yangtze River, uh, Suzhou and Shanghai area, uh, you may see this kind of uh, residential uh, buildings, building along the rivers, um, the great roof tower and whitewash um, wall, um, even the layouts um, is quite different from what you have seen in, uh, in the previous photos. If you move northward to Beijing, the capital city of China, um, you probably uh, will visit uh, the Forbidden Cities. So you can see this kind of imperial architectures. The, the architecture is very different from those in Jiangnan, in southern Fujian, and what we have in Singapore. Um, this kind of imperial architecture was designed for the imperial family, which are different um, um, color scheme and different um, spatial qualities um, that thing for the uh, imperial family. To understand the uh, Chinese architecture, um, it would be very helpful to read this uh, book are entitled um, Pictorial History of Chinese Architecture. Um, this book was written by Liang Shichen uh, in 1940s. Um, the first edition was actually published in the United States by MIT Press in 1984, um, after he died in uh, 1972. 
um, it was added by the Wima Fairbank, uh, Fairbank, a very close friend to uh, Liang family. Uh, in 2001, uh, this book, originally written in English, was translated from English to Chinese by Liang Chongjie, uh, Liang Shichen's son. Um, so it became the bilingual edition for this book. And this book is extremely helpful for the beginners to uh, have a basic understanding of the Chinese architecture. Uh, who is Liang Shichen and who is Lin Huiying? For those students from China, I think you are familiar with this couple. This is the wedding photo for the couple. This is Liang Shichen and Lin Huiying. Uh, Liang Shichen was born in 1901 and died in 1972. Uh, his wife, Lin Huiying, beautiful ladies, um, was born in 1904 and passed away in 1955. Liang Shichen, his father, um, was a famous Chinese scholar and the social reformer. So this couple, they were Chinese-English bilingual. Uh, they received very good training in classical uh, Chinese. And Liang Shichen uh, went to the Tsinghua College Receive English edit, uh, English language editations to prepare for the study in the United States. And Lin Huiying, at a very young age, followed her father to UK and went to the uh, English girls' school. So the English and Chinese language, uh, both are very good. Uh, they study architecture uh, in the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, United States. Um, after graduation, they got married, and after a very short time of their practicing in the States, the couple uh, returned back to China, became the first generation of the Chinese architectural uh, historians, contribute uh, a lot to the study of the um, history of Chinese um, architecture. Um, that me quote from the uh, Wimmer of that back, uh, the editor of this book. Uh, she said that uh, Liang Shichen, Lin Huiying, and other, um, the first generation of Chinese architectural historians, they were the remarkable generation of Chinese intellectuals, uh, bilingual and bicultural, who achieved the miracle of bridging the gap between East and West. So they used what they learned a lot in the West and to apply it to the uh, study of the Chinese uh, architecture and that the, the Western readers know the significance and the, uh, the amazing um, part of the uh, Chinese architecture. Um, the book and, and many other uh, researches uh, this couple completed actually based on the extensive fieldwork investigations um, they conducted uh, of the you know, ancient Chinese architecture in northern part of China from 1932 to 1942. Um, as you can see from these two photos, uh, this young couple um, standing on, on the roof of the, one of the buildings they uh, investigated. Um, this is in Wei Ying climbing up to measure a monument. So based on this uh, field work they conducted, uh, Liang Shichen uh, was able to write the manuscript uh, in English. At the time, uh, he has already um, quite sure that the books, the target uh, readers, the Western readers. So uh, he completed the manuscript in 1946. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, this book is a very good uh, introduction to the study of the Chinese architectural history, but uh, different from the other books um, about the Chinese um, architecture. It's not a complete account. Uh, Liang Shichen did have a very big plan for um, the study of the uh, Chinese architectural history, but he can only complete a, uh, a small part of it and turn into the manuscript. Uh, 
Um, but this book is a very good uh, summary of the Liang's early research on Chinese um, architecture. Uh, when Liang Shiten and Lin, Lin, Lin Huiying uh, returned back to China to um, develop the research uh, of their um, Chinese architecture, the challenges uh, they were facing is that um, the Chinese architecture was designed and built and developed by the craftsmen's. Um, people enjoying the space, uh, they built it, but uh, never really uh, look at the um, Know the knowledge and the techniques behind it. So the technique and skills of the craftsmen actually was passing down through the apprenticeship. apprenticeship. Um, so there was lack of their systematical uh, documentations and scholarly analysis. So when they are uh, studied um, as Liang Shichen, as I quoted from Liang Shichen in 1941, in one of the articles uh, he wrote uh, about his uh, findings and so on, he said that um, the ultimate aim is the compilation of a history of a Chinese architecture, a subject that has been virtually untouched by scholars in the past. Uh, we, found we could find little or no material in books. We have had to hunt for extra specimens so that's the situation uh, they had it in 1930s when they started the research. Uh, fortunately, um, in 1929, uh, their society later became an institute for research in Chinese architecture was founded in Beijing by a retired, rich uh, Chinese office, <laughs> uh, Zhu Qijian. Uh, yeah. um, the Chinese name for this society is Zhongguo Yinzhang Xueshe. So Liang Shichen, Lin Huiying, and, uh, and other um, uh, young architects, Chinese architects, were recruited to join these uh, societies. They stopped the field work uh, in northern part of China in 1932. Um, so to develop a research on the Chinese architecture, uh, this is what we can learn from uh, this first generation of Chinese architectural historians that no textbook, no books, uh, very few documents. So they learn from the field. Uh, they conduct a lot of field work. Um, no information, yet they, they, they read the, the, the gazetteers, um, you know, the, some writings, some some tales, and the map all the routes and sites. Um, they go to the site and search for the heritage. One, yeah, there's a lot of uh, disappointments, also excitements uh, on the road. Um, after they find the buildings, the architectures, they started to measure and record um, the heritage. Then they start analyze it. So they were able to um, work up the, the glossary of the technical terms that is very, very useful for the uh, later research on the Chinese architecture and develop the analogous terms for the architectural history. Um, after you know, almost 100 years, we're still looking at this kind of uh, uh, the, the writings and research uh, we developed. Uh, as Yang Shichen uh, summarized, uh, the structure of Chinese architecture has retained its organic qualities. For him, the Chinese architecture is a very organic architecture, uh, which are due to the ingenious and articulate construction of the timber skeleton, the timber structure, where the size, shape, and the positions of every member, every architecture components is determined, determined by the structural necessity. Even later in uh, Qing Dynasty, um, the structural components uh, may be covered by the intricate, um, you know, the carving and so on. But they still remain the so could uh, retain the structural necess necessities for the uh, Chinese architecture. So the study of the Chinese building is primarily a study of its anatomy. Uh, for this reason, 
the section joints are much more important than the elevations. Uh, actually, the timber structure uh, may be certain part may be covered by the uh, the ceiling itself. So to understand Chinese architecture, you have to look at the uh, structural systems. Um, in the early 20th centuries, uh, Liang Shichen and other Chinese historians, architectural historians, uh, putting so much effort in researching on the uh, Chinese architecture, it's not just to document it and to record it. Uh, actually, they have these kind of questions in, uh, in mind, uh, like the, what Yang Shichen said. Can the traditional Chinese structural system find a new expression in this new materials, uh, reinforced concrete and, and steel and glass and so on, because uh, they study architecture in the West, already know the uh, impact of the modern uh, architecture, Western modern architectures. So the, they were worrying about the dying of the uh, traditional Chinese architecture in China. So they raised the questions and try to figure out what's the essence of Chinese architecture was the Chineseness of Chinese architecture. So this is why they uh, apply the so-called Western kind of kind of uh, systematical um, ways of analyzing architecture to the uh, uh, analysis of the uh, Chinese architecture. And actually in early 20s, uh, early 20th centuries uh, in China, as you can see, some uh, Western architect already uh, try to uh, imitate uh, traditional Chinese architecture and to apply some of the features to the modern architecture as this one you see the school buildings built by the uh, Beijing Daxue Peking uh, University and uh, in similar periods in Singapore uh, uh, this one was designed by the Murphy American architect and then I are Chinese Methodist uh, church designed by the Swan and McLellan uh, you can see that uh, there are some uh, Chinese architecture features. Uh, you can sense it from the design of these buildings. Um, that is catered to the uh, uh, Chinese um, in order to present a, a kind of you know, Chinese cultures. Um, in 1920s in Xiamen, where the Tang Ka Ki uh, founded uh, Amoy University, he also uh, tried to you know, um, adapt the school buildings to have certain kind of uh, architectural characters of the southern Fujian. So they applied this kind of roof on top of the uh, this kind of, uh, actually the, bod the body itself is modern architecture. Uh, in 1950s in Singapore, um, the Chinese community here um, said that this uh, Chinese language university in Southeast Asia they're also thinking about how the school buildings can present certain kind of uh, Chinese-ness. Um, so uh, this is the reasons why uh, in the early tw uh, 20th century, uh, um, the Chinese uh, uh, architectural historians, they um, started the uh, research on the Chinese architecture. So in this book, uh, Yang Shishin tried to summarize some basic, basic uh, character characteristics of Chinese architecture. Uh, in order to that the Western uh, readers to understand um, you know, the compositions of the Chinese architecture. So uh, according to him, uh, the Chinese architecture consists of uh, three uh, parts, like the human being, a person who have a head, body, and foot, then you can stand on the ground. So this is the drawings, uh, hand drawings, uh, uh, he and his assistant made it. So uh, this is the base of the uh, the buildings, and uh, you can see the uh, there are the platform, the steps going down, and this at the corner of the base you have the corner of uh, pile, and you have the uh, the curb. So he used Chinese and English uh, to illustrate and uh, to you know annotate uh, these these drawings. So the central part is the body of the buildings. So uh, you can see the uh, columns. Uh, the entrance. Uh, this is the uh, central bay. Uh, the space between the two columns we call bay. Uh, um, we, um, well, in, in Chinese, uh, yeah. Uh, the, uh, you can see the uh, dogong over here. 
uh, above the body is the roof, uh, the pitched roof, uh, which uh, overhanging E. This is quite a uh, strong, uh, you know, uh, the character of the Chinese architecture. And you can also see the uh, the dogong, do and dogong. Um, their bracket set is supporting the overhang, overhanging uh, eaves. So uh, over the roof, you can see that man reach uh, the hips, uh, even the uh, dun shou, uh, the, the animal features uh, sticking over the hips. Um, the, this dashed line shows the structural system of the roof. You can see the beam, um, perine, uh, even the rafters uh, sticking over the uh, perine. So these are uh, drawings shows the you know um, every um, Chinese architecture actually could be uh, identified um, with these uh, three um, uh, components. Uh, what made uh, Chinese architecture different from traditional Western architecture? Uh, Liang Sujian summarized that um, because the timber structures, uh, the Chinese architecture has a great freedom in warring and demonstrations. Um, it's the column and beam uh, support the roof um, to receive the row. So actually uh, the wall uh, is free from the receiving the row. So actually the partition um, in, for the uh, Chinese architecture is quite free. So for the interior space of the Chinese architecture, you have a great uh, flexibility and adaptability to use the interior uh, spaces. Um, so this is why in Chinese in China there's a saying that that uh, uh, that means the wall the wall collapse uh, the house will still stand because the partition uh, is not the supporting uh, structure. Uh, but I want to highlight that um, despite uh, they have the you know basic uh, characteristic uh, of Chinese architecture, but actually for the expressions of the constructions varied uh, in different regions uh, in China. That's something uh, we will talk about in, in later lectures. Uh, one of the distinguished uh, features of Chinese architecture is the curved roof. Actually for uh, many uh, traditional architectures uh, in the West, in, the, in Asia, uh, pitched roof uh, is, um, was quite common to see the pitched roof. But uh, what made Chinese pitched roof different is that uh, the Chinese uh, invented uh, quite a unique structural system that allowed them to create quite the curved um, roof. And uh, this is sections uh, Liang Shiten, uh, they draw it uh, as the illustrations for the book. This section showing the flexibility being skeleton supporting the curved roof. So uh, this is the ground, uh, this is the columns. Uh, as you can see here, uh, he tried to labor all the architectural uh, elements. Uh, you can find it on these sections. Uh, this is the pitched roof. Uh, you know, you can see the curve over here. This is the uh, man being over here. Um, this is the uh, one of the post sitting over the uh, being over here, so, uh, supporting the man ridge. So this one was called the king post. Um, this is the towers, towers over here, um, set on the mud, uh, resting over the uh, um, the rafters over here. And this one referred to this uh, camel hump. This is a direct translation of this uh, Chinese characters. This one actually supports uh, these uh, uh, splinters over here. Um, this is the liang, the bing over here. And you can see this, uh, this shorter raptor. This shorter raptor actually was sitting over this ring over here. So actually that means you can use the smaller uh, timber members to craft a very big roof. And because this the, the smaller size of the raptor allow you to create not a straight uh, roof, uh, instead you can create a curved roof over here. Um, this kind of curved roof is quite uh, significant for the timber uh, structures because uh, timbers always worry about you know the uh, you know the 
the water is the rainwater. So you can imagine if when the rainwater drop of the curved loops, it will be flushed uh, faster uh, and further away from the uh, the timber structure uh, over here. So in a way to protect the timber structure. Uh, you may notice at the end uh, the the eave is slanting upwards. Uh, use another uh, circuit treatments for the loop. Uh, to ensure that uh, the rainwater could be flushed away and further. And this kind of treatments also allow that the, the light can go in deeper into the, uh, the houses. Um, as you can see, uh, the Chinese curved pitch roof, uh, pit curved pitch roof is very different from the Western roof structural system. Um, you can compare. So actually, these are uh, timber structure, column, beam, and pillaring, uh, raptor. Uh, they work up this particular uh, frame for the uh, for the building to receive the roof from the rooftops and transport it to the ground over here. So this is the uh, drawing shows the western roof truss systems. Um, uh, the timbers and other materials was used to crop the you know the truss systems. You can see the straight lines, uh, straight roof. Um, that could be crafted by the uh, Western Trump, uh, Western uh, Trust systems. And another very unique character is actually the Chinese architecture's uh, hat. Is this uh, Dou Gong? Uh, this is Dou and Gong. Um, translated into English, uh, could be the bracket set. You know, a set of brackets. Uh, some people translate it as a bracket and being. Um, also, there uh, actually is a uh, kind of uh, interlocking wooden bracket. And this is one of the illustrations shows the basic bracket uh, set. Uh, let me explain to you. Uh, let us follow the Liang uh, Shixian's annotations. This is the base of the this uh, dou gong, called it the uh, lu dou. You can see this is a uh, square square. Um, look like the um, the dou 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 is a kind of uh, container. Or, or no, uh, mirroring grains uh, in traditional China, uh, Chinese society. So there's lot of this uh, mortise over here. In Chinese, we call it the ko, the mouse. So this is the gong, look like the arm. So this arm actually was sitting over this uh, doodle. Then above uh, this arm, actually this is the dough. So this dough also have another uh, uh, mortise here. That can receive the um, uh, another arm. So, dogong can have many many layers you know, through the interlocking um, systems. Um, you can use the smaller member of the uh, timber to build out very big uh, circuit uh, brackets uh, set to support the uh, the very heavy uh, roof. Uh, to make the dogong possible uh, is because uh, for the Chinese architecture, you probably heard about that for the Chinese architecture, uh, they don't have uh, nails, they don't have uh, adhesive uh, materials to join it. Uh, the Chinese have this kind of tendon and uh, mortise work, uh, wood joints to connect the different uh, uh, timber, the wooden members. So as you can see, uh, there's some slot over here, and this uh, tenant uh, could be uh, locked uh, with the, uh, the members over here. Uh, I'd like to uh, show you a short uh, video. Um, this is the uh, video uh, I get from the YouTube. Uh, this is a 3D Max. Um, I think the a team in China, they built it um, to demonstrate the how traditional Chinese architecture on this building. Okay, okay, I think I zoomed it. Okay. Um this is um uh, I'm screen today. 